So welcome everybody. I, like I said, like uh, Inyaki said, I'm Leon. And thank you, Inyaki, for giving me this uh, opportunity to be here uh, and present my work. So I'm going to talk about uh, Grammar Guide Genetic Programming. Um, and I'm going to talk about some things of my thesis. Um, one thing, Genetic Engine, which is a framework for Grammar Guide Genetic Programming. And um, uh, my actual thesis, which was about feature learning. Um, I did my thesis together with Alcide Fonseca, Professor Alcide Fonseca, at the Faculty of Sciences at the University of Lisbon um, in the, the La Siege group. So, I will start with introducing myself quickly. I'm Leon, like I've already said. I was born in Amsterdam, Netherlands, uh, where I did my, master, uh, my bachelor in mathematics. I then traveled through South America, and that's why I also speak Spanish, so you can speak Spanish to me if you want. Then I did a master of da in data science at the University of Lisbon, where I did my thesis um, with Alcide Fonseca, um, whom I'm also still working with. So today I will talk about, uh, start with the context of my work. Then I'm going to quickly introduce genetic programming. I think that most of you will um, already know about that, but I'll do that anyways. Um, I will talk about grammar guide genetic programming. Um, and different representations in grammar guide genetic programming. This is also one of the most the main things why I'm here um, is the different representations in grammar guide genetic programming. Then I'll talk about the framework that we built at La Siege for my thesis and finally about the optimization of feature learning using grammar guide genetic programming. Um, and then I'll talk tell you why I'm actually here. <laughs> so um, the context of all this work is obviously machine learning, which is a group of methods that leverages data to uh, perform better in certain tasks. And mostly there's two metrics for machine learning, and one of them is performance, to see how well it performs at solving a task, and secondly, there's interpretability, to see how well we understand how it solves the task. And what we normally see is that most methods um, have either very high performance and low interpretability or very well are very easily interpreted but are not so easy uh, are not so good uh, performing wise and because of this we are studying genetic programming which is a method that is actually quite good at both for certain um, uh, problems so I will talk about genetic program for a bit. I'll give a short introduction. And now I've made it a little bit more fun with uh, some images for you guys. So genetic programming is a uh, method that initializes um, programs and tries to evolve a program that actually solves a certain solution. So um, it starts off by initializing a whole population of certain solutions. In this case, we will look at SpongeBob um, individuals. Each individual, each problem is then evaluated and seen how well they are, they, uh, how fit they are. So how well does an individual actually work? So some will work well and some will work badly, poorly. Um, based on this fitness, individuals are selected and based on this selections, um, new individuals are, rep uh, are produced. There's two methods for production that are mostly used. One is crossover. This takes two individuals and creates a new individual. So two well-performing individuals create a new individual or a mutation where you have one individual and you uh, mutate it to a new individual. These reproductions are then again evaluated, again selected, and again new individuals are produced. This continues and continues until we have one certain solution, which depends on the problem we have, will be a solution to the problem and hopefully a good solution. It's very hard to find the best solution, but hopefully we find a good solution. There are certain advantages of genetic programming. First of all, like I already said, it's interpretable. Second of all, it gives the opportunity to use very flexible solution spaces. And lastly, it can handle heterogeneous data set types. There's also certain disadvantages. Um, because of the usage of um, the flexible solution space, solutions can become very complex and very large and therefore are less interpretable or can be very slow. Um, and that's the second point there, can be very slow. Something that is used to restrict the search space of genetic programming is grammars. And that's where um, grammar guide genetic programming comes into play. 
So grammar guided genetic programming uses grammars to restrict the search space. So, for example, you can take out individuals and that will impl influence the whole search process. On the other hand, you can also introduce new uh, individuals and that will also influence the uh, search process. I don't know if you've ever seen a grammar and that's why I was quickly introduced it. Um, this is the starting symbol and the starting symbol is a uh, non-terminal. All of these are non-terminals and this is a rule. And each rule can have different productions. In the, this, for example, we've got three productions. The expression can be an expression, operator, expression, a variable or a constant. An operator can be a plus, a minus or a multiplication and so on. Um, these grammars, they um, def can define the syntax of a language. And in this way, we can define what a solution looks like. So this was all the background. We've got genetic programming, we've got grammar guide genetic programming, and within grammar guide genetic programming, there's multiple representation types. And these different representation types have been the basis of discussion for a long time. And this discussion is also the reason that I'm here, um, because uh, people believe that certain representations work better than others. The most famous representation is used for the method called grammatical evolution. Um, grammatical evolution uses strings to represent individuals. A string is then um, mapped uh, with a genotype to phenotype mapping using the grammar to an individual. I will now shortly show how that is done. Um, so for example, you start off with the first, um, first uh, element of the string and this uh, defines how you um, produce a grammar rule. So we start with the function. The function only has a single production rule, so we just create an expression. I show expression with this little dot. We go to the next rule. This is an expression. And as we have got a one here, we have to uh, choose the first ex uh, rule, the first production rule. So we get an expression operator expression. For the next one, we get the same, because it's again a one. Then we have to look at this node, and we see that we have got a two. Because of this, we take the second expression rule, and we get a variable. Now we want to uh, extend the variable, and we've got a one again, which will become an x. This continues like this, and we get the whole individual. So this is grammatical evolution, how it goes from one, from an from a, uh, individual, from a representation to the actual individu individual. Notice that in this case, the, not the whole individual is used, not the whole representation is used. So certain parts are not used. This is very important because this, um, in the end, has some negative effects on grammatical evolution. I will talk about that later. So I already talked about evolutionary operations and grammatical evolution has crossover and the way it does crossover is just very simple. It, um, it combines two in, um, representations by cutting substrings and putting them together. Mutation is done by selecting one codon and uh, simply mutating it. Grammatical evolution is most famous and maybe I think that everybody that works with genetic grammar guide genetic programming works with this here as well. The representation that I use mostly is tree-based grammar guide genetic programming um, and instead of having a different, uh, a different difference between the genotype and the phenotype it uses trees as the individuals itself. So the genotype and the phenotype are the same. Genotype equals phenotype. Tree-based grammar guide genetic programming is often called context-free grammar SGP, but it's a bit of an ambiguous name, so I don't like it so much. The way that we construct these trees is, by, uh, is using the grammar. So the grammar defines how we um, initialize a tree. Um, Tree-based grammar guided genetic programming does crossover as follows. You take two subtrees and you combine them into a new tree. This is much harder to implement, less straightforward, but it's logically more, um, uh, it makes more sense logically. Mutation is also done in the same way. You take one 
nodes and you can change it into a new subtree. So these two representation methods have been very for a long time have been um, the basis of discussion like I already said. Grammatical evolution has uh, and tree-based grammar guided genetic programming have had a lot of research and the main research that has come uh, and, and uh, ha has, has derived from this is that um, the grammatical evolution has the linear string as a representation and this representation is much simpler and because of this, this it's much more memory efficient because you just have a string of, of, uh, of, of, of integers. Furthermore, individual generation is much quicker. Also, the evolutionary operations are much more easily um, implemented and they are also quicker. One problem, though, is that there is a high redundancy. Like I already said, the string wasn't completely used. There were still integers left that were not used. Because of this, there's a lot of information in the, in the, in the representation that doesn't contribute to the phenotype in the end. When we, for example, mutate a, a, a single gene in that part of the string, this doesn't affect the phenotype later, which is problematic because this will reduce the um, diversity of the population. I will not go into this further, but you can come to me later to talk about this. Tree-based grammar guided genetic programming, on the other hand, has individuals that are less simple. Obviously, there is less memory efficient, the individual generation is slower, and evolutionary operations are less easily implemented, and they are slower. But almost all the tree is used to, uh, all, the whole individual is the individual itself, and so there's no information kept that is not um, relevant to the, uh, to the phenotype of the individual. There's a slight, there's a tiny um, exception for that, but uh, I, that doesn't, is not relevant for them. The second most um, distinctive part of grammatical evolution is that the genotype and the phenotype, they are decoupled. So you've got this genotype to phenotype mapping. What is very nice about this is that algorithms can be applied to the linear string only. And because the linear string is not completely problem independent, um, this algorithm can be reused for uh, all problems. The only thing that changes is the grammar itself. The problem is, is that there can be many invalid individuals. So you can create an individual and this can be invalid because, for example, it's too big or it has a division by zero. These are things that can also be remediated, but there's certain maybe um, invalid individuals that can uh, uh, be created because you create a genotype and you don't know what the phenotype is until you do this mapping. Furthermore, there's low locality. When you change one part of the string, this can have a very big effect on the phenotype. Because of this, when you mutate or do a crossover, the, the parents, we call them parents, might not look like the child. And this can be problematic because you actually are choosing um, parents to, be, to, 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 to reproduce because they've got a good phenotype. If the phenotype then doesn't look like its parents, then why did you choose it in the first place? On the other hand, it's also a positive side, which is that it's very, it creates extra diversity in the population. On the other hand, grammar guide genetic programming, phenotype and genotype are the same, and therefore algorithms cannot always be applied to different problems. Like I already said, you almost have no invalid individuals because you are already creating individuals at, the be at, at, at uh, when, when you, um, uh, you, you create in, uh, individuals um, as their phenotype, and therefore you can also directly check that it doesn't do anything wrong. Um, moreover, when you change something, you change exactly that part of the node, and therefore it will, except for that part of the, no of the tree, it will, for the, all the rest, will stay the same, and therefore it has a high locality. Grammatical evolution directly has um, been shown that it has, because of the high redundancy and low locality, like I just said, it can result that gram grammatical evolution resembles random search. Um, and it has been said, shown that tree-based grammar guided genetic programming performs better than grammatical evolution. But lately, there has been a new, so these two methods, grammatical evolution and tree-based grammar, grammar guided genetic programming, are from the 90s. Um, last, so in 2016, I believe, 
structured grammatical evolution was introduced by Nuno Lorenzo from Coimbra in uh, Portugal um, and a bunch of other uh, people. Uh, structured grammatical evolution uh, was introduced to remediate this low locality and high redundancy, but it breaks with the simplicity of grammatical evolution. So how does structured grammatical evolution work? So grammatic, structured grammatical evolution uses instead of this single singular uh, uh, linear uh, string, it uses a linear string for each production rule. Because of this, uh, and, this, and, this, and this is then again used in a genotype to phenotype mapping to um, create uh, the phenotype. Because of this method, um, when you change something, you will always change it within its um, it's the, the, the choices that you make for a certain um, production will always be the same. So you will see the same types of production in the phenotype. It will still maybe look a bit different, but there are certain things that will be very similar. Um, the crossover in structured grammatical evolution uh, works as follows. You choose a couple of the, um, uh, a number of the uh, linear strings and you put them together to make a new individual. And the mutation is itself as, as the same as in linear, uh, uh, in no, the normal grammatical evolution. So we've seen now tree-based grammar guide genetic programming, normal uh, grammatical evolution, and structured grammatical evolution. I'm going to now explain one last uh, method, which is called probabilistic grammatical evolution. This is another um, uh, representation method. In my, I, in my, uh, I actually think that this is not a real representation um, method, but it is in this uh, method um, implemented as such. But um, you can also apply this to other uh, representations. So, so what probabilistic GE does, it uses probabilistic grammars. So what are probabil probabilistic grammars? Normally, we say that each production rule is chosen saying, well, if we see a one, then we choose the first one. If we see a two, then we choose the second one. If we see a three, then we choose the third one. In that way, in that sense, each um, production rule has the same probability of being chosen. And therefore, there is 0 0.33 for each one. Uh, or, in this case, there is 0 0.5. This isn't necessarily... Um, we can also change this. We can change this to say, well, actually, we want this rule to be taken half of the time and both of these only 0 0.25 um, uh, with a probability of 0 0.25. Um, what probabilistic grammatical evolution does is instead of using a linear string of integers, it uses probabilities. And each probability tells you which production rule you take. So the first one says, okay, 0 0.8 is smaller than 1, well, we just get a, uh, an expression. The second one is 0 0.2. Because of that, we choose the first one because it's below 0 0.33. And so on, and so on, and so on. What probabilistic GE then does is that it updates the grammar after each generation. So based on which productions are most important, it updates the grammar. And in this sense, it evolves the grammar. So if you see that the best individual has a certain production rule which happens more often, then you might think this production rule is more important and we want to see it more often. So. A quick recap. We've got grammatical evolution with linear strings. We've got tree-based grammar guide genetic programming with trees. We've got structured grammatical evolution with lists of linear strings. And we've got probabilistic GE with strings of probabilities. And these also include the update of grammars. The problem is, is that right now there's no framework that supports all of the above representations. Uh, well, at least to my knowledge. Um, and most um, comparisons of all of these uh, different um, representations are done using different frameworks of different people. So um, what we did in my thesis is actually introduce a framework that does have this, and that is Genetic Engine. Um, genetic Engine is 
Well, wait, I'm gonna drink some water because I'm talking a lot. Mm. So Genetic Engine is a grammar guide pro uh, genetic programming framework uh, um, built at La Siege together with Al Siege team um, and I am part of that. And Genetic Engine in its core is an open source grammar guide genetic, uh, gr genetic programming framework in Python and we've recently finally been able to um, uh, publish it as the data types is a more economic front end for grammar guided genetic programming. I will explain about that more later. You can look at it on GitHub here. The most um, interesting thing, in my, uh, in my um, opinion, is the fact that Genetic Engine uses uh, Python to define the grammar instead of BNF. So it's completely done in Python, so it's completely Python native uh, framework. It has in-notes evaluation and other benefits that I um, will not go into now, but you can come to me about that later. The way that we define a grammar is done in Python, and I will show you that now. So, for example, we'll start with the expression, and you define that as an abstract class in Python. If you then want to define, for example, the plus and the multiplication operators, you do that by extending the expression abstract class and saying how, um, what the arguments are of the plus and how you will evaluate a node like this. The same for multiplication. Notice that here you sum the evaluation of this argument and here you multiply the uh, evaluation of the arguments. This is all just straight from Python. If you then want to include a variable, you do it like this. You again extend the expression using the variable and you, dis and you uh, define what are the names of the um, variables um, with a far range meta handler. The ev evaluation just takes the whole column of the data set. Then, if you want to define, uh, if you want a production rule with a constant, you do the same, but this time you annotate it with an integer. And in this case, we say the integer has to be between zero and nine, uh, before we had one and two, but it's, uh, we, you can just change that easily, and you evaluate it like this. Finally, you extract the grammar. This is just a function that is implemented in Genetic Engine, and this can then um, define um, is then extracting this grammar. This is how the grammar definition is done in Genetic Engine. Um, because of this. The, the, we can actually, um, the, 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 the individuals that we produce are just um, instances of all these classes. So they are actually trees that are instances of the grammar that we show here. An interesting thing in here is that, for example, there's a lot of differences, but one of the very nice things about this way of implementing is that the float definition is much easier in Genetic Engine. For example, a float in BNF would mostly be um, defined as follows. So the float has to be an integer before and a natural behind. An, an, an integer is a natural or a negative natural. A natural is a constant and a natural and constant and a constant is like this. In genetic engine, we just say, well, the value has to be a float because the float is a, just a type of um, in Python and it can be instantiated as such, a random float. Genetic engine currently features tree-based grammar guide, genetic programming, grammatical evolution, probabilistic grammatical evolution, structured gra uh, grammatical evolution, and probabilistic structured grammatical evolution, and also probabilistic um, tree-based gram grammar guide, genetic programming, but we've not um, tested that yet, but it should work as well. So this was Genetic Engine. That is my framework that I, uh, uh, that, well, not my framework, but our framework that I, um, that you can use, and I think it's very, uh, straightforward, very easy to use, um, with good documentation, um, and you can have a look at it if you want. My own thesis was on Genetic Engine, because that was almost, like the implementation of that was probably 70% of my work, but I then used it and applied it to feature learning. So I will talk a bit about that now. Feature learning, uh, yes. 
the, yeah. When did you use the grammar? Just the beginning of the mm -hmm. No, so you use it at the initiation by, so when you say, when you define uh, the tree, so you, you create the tree using the grammar, but you also use it when you mutate or do crossover. Because when you do a mutation, you want, um, you uh, take a tree node, wait, I'm gonna, ah, maybe this is not, I'm doing it already. When you take a tree, Oh, this way is way too far. Sorry, guys. When you take a tree node... Oh, no. You define... So you take this tree node, which in this case is an expression. You have to know what are the possibilities of the uh, expression um, productions. So there again, you use the, the, the tree node. Also, in the crossover, so here you cross over this one and this, like uh, you put this one on this, and this can only happen um, when that is actually compatible. And that is again, you take from the grammar. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, do you, you maintain the, the condition of the, of the, of the Yes, definitely. So the 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 the, the node is um, so the node. If you instantiate it, so this node is an argument of this node. Uh, of the, so, so, for example, you've got a tree saying plus, and then under that you've got another expression. This, this expression is an argument of that node. So you'll get uh, a very long, uh, like, a tree of um, arguments within each other. Um, I, 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 I don't know how I would be able to say that in a, in a different way, but maybe that already explains it. Yeah. Yeah. So you can also go in, so when you evaluate, you, for example, you've got the top node and you call the evaluation function of that top node. If that is a plus, you say, well, the evaluation of the plus node is the evaluation of its left argument and the Elevation, uh, uh, evaluation of its right argument and the summation of those two things. Yeah. Yes. So what you say, you find the node and you don't find it as the node itself, but you find it as the argument of that node. So. Exactly. So you say, well, we want to evaluate the argument of me. So you find the node and you say, I want to evaluate this argument of this, of this node. And then you've, uh, the, you, you mutate it and then it becomes, it is instantiated as an argument to that node. To know which instantiation, which, which mutation is allowed. Yeah. No, no, thank you for the question. So the optimization of feature learning through grammar guide genetic programming. To start off, I will talk about feature learning, just a quick um, introduction. So feature learning, I can talk about only if I also talk about feature engineering. Um, feature engineering is a group of methods that, use, uh, that um, transform a data set. Um, one method is feature selection, which just says certain features are used, certain features are not used. Another method is feature construction, which uses different features, combines them to make new features. And another method is feature generation, which looks at the data set in general and then combines um, different parts of the data set to create new features. And in this case, for example, the sum of all the numbers of feature one are available for each data point. Feature engineering is extremely labor intensive. Because of its intensity, the automation of feature engineering is very valuable. And this is called well, we call it feature learning, and these names are all a bit um, 
ambiguous, but this is one of the uh, ways of saying it. So this is feature learning, the automation of feature engineering. Um, we, uh, there is already certain genetic programming based feature learning methods. And the most famous method, well, some people say it's not the most famous, but a very famous method is M3GP. This was introduced by uh, a number of, um, of uh, uh, people, including um, Salah Silva, who is also at my faculty. And M3GP um, evolves a um, mapping between two feature sets. So it, it can map one data set to a new data set, and it evolves the, the, the feature set to see what the feature set performs better, and you can define what is better in that sense. In my thesis, I use domain knowledge to uh, incorporating, uh, incorporating grammars to restrict the search base of M3GP and to hopefully improve it. I call this domain knowledge M3GP. So what is domain knowledge? Well, suppose we've got a data set and we want to do some kind of feature learning. So um, we take this feature two, which is numbers, and we multiply it with feature one, um, which also is numbers in this case. So this would make sense. Um, we know that feature one and feature two, we can just multiply them because they're two numbers. But what if we then find out that this is actually the zip code? The zip code, actually doesn't have anything to do with its numerical value. It has to do something with the location. So the multiplication of the zip code with a feature is not really sensical. What would make sense is, for example, saying, is this zip code from Madrid? Yes, then we want to do this, and yet no, then we want to do this. This is a feature that we can also learn. And this does make sense. And this keeps the zip code in its location value instead of its numerical value. So that is what we implemented in this um, domain knowledge in CGP. Another thing that I did was include aggregation into the grammar. And that is extending the search space. And I call that domain knowledge aggregation M3GP. So what is aggregation? <laughs> Suppose you've got a data set with, for example, the bikes recorded um, that, 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 you, that shows what are the bikes every day of what the number of bikes that are recorded. And suppose you want to predict the bikes recorded for tomorrow. What would make sense is combine all the historic data and say, well, let's just look at the average and say that might be a good prediction of tomorrow. What we did was extend this and say, well, suppose you've got another, data, another feature, for example, the weather. And we know, the domain knowledge, that the weather impacts biking habit. And we also see it. So on rainy days, people don't go biking. And on sunny days, people go biking a lot. So if we know that tomorrow will be sunny, then let's just take the average of the sunny days. So. That, those are the two methods, domain knowledge M3GP and domain knowledge and aggregation M3GP. And I, combined, I evaluated them on two data sets. The first one was the boom bikes, just used the bikes. And we saw that um, domain knowledge M3GP, the orange one, improved slightly um, M3GP, and the aggregation improved it by a lot. We also did an evaluation of the credit G data set, which was a classification um, problem. And we saw that M3GP was very struggling a lot with um, improving, um, where uh, domain knowledge M3GP performed very well. And actually, aggregation uh, deteriorated the performance a bit. So it was not very necessary, and it actually um, kept the search process from evolving quicker. Um, ah. Yeah, so this is a conclusion site, a slide, but this shouldn't be the name. Um, so my conclusions were um, that domain knowledge benefits the interpretability, because it also interpret, uh, uh, benefits the interpretability, and the performance of certain uh, feature learning problems and that aggregation uh, benefits the fitness progression of certain um, uh, feature learning problems. So all this said, 
why am I here? <laughs> um, so the reason I'm here is to work on the comparison of grammar guide genetic programming uh, representations on a uh, reg uh, regression problem. And regression problems are also sometimes, you can also use them for feature learning, so there's a lot of overlap there. And mainly, um, I will be extending on a paper uh, that was introduced, uh, that was published by uh, Iñaki, the reason I'm here, uh, and also Chema, who I will meet tomorrow here, uh, Nuno Lorenzo and Oscar Granica, who is also, um, uh, Oscar is also, uh, ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, hi Oscar. Um, and um, which, uh, which compared structured grammatical evolution and normal grammatical evolution on a real world data set um, that included uh, people with diabetes. Um, one part, the first part, is to not only compare grammatical evolution and structured grammatical evolution, but also uh, include tree-based grammar guide genetic programming and probabilistic grammatical evolution. Then, hopefully, I would like, or well, let's see, um, uh, if there's time, we, I will also introduce, uh, try to incorporate domain knowledge to improve the solution space. Because right now, the feature engineering is done manu manually, and it might be uh, interesting to also take that out and completely do it um, uh, using uh, my methods. But it already works quite well, so I'm not sure if that would uh, add it a lot. That was it. Thank you so much.